Hello and welcome to Frost Over the World, a packed edition again. Later in the programme, Jesse Jackson on President Obama's midterm blues, plus war photographer Rankin, and a debate on why sorry is, these days at least, the easiest word. But first, Afghanistan. President Hamid Karzai worried, to put it mildly, uh, Western diplomats this week when he unilaterally took control of his country's key electoral watchdog. The Afghan president will now be in charge of appointing officials to the Electoral Complaints Commission, the very organization that exposed the massive fraud of last summer's presidential elections and forced Karzai into agreeing to a second round of voting, which didn't actually take place, but they were the people who forced it to be approved by Karzai. I'm joined now by Peter Galbraith. During the elections, he was the most senior American official at the UN mission in Afghanistan, but lost his job when he called for an honest recount of the votes, an honest recount. Peter, this news, this week's news, how serious is it? It's stunning. Uh, it's a, a finger in the eye of the Western countries who have troops on the ground. Uh, it is a real blow to uh, Afghan democracy, uh, and it's a blow to the prospects for stability in Afghanistan. Let me explain what happened. In last August's presidential elections, they were overseen by an Afghan body called the Independent Election Commission. Uh, but the only thing that in was independent about it was the name. In fact, all seven members were appointed by Karzai. In the end, there were a million phony votes for Karzai, one-third of his total. And in each and every instance of fraud, massive fraud, this Independent Election Commission or its staff either organized the fraud, collaborated with those who committed the fraud, or in the most benign case, knew about the fraud and didn't report it. There was a separate body called the Electoral Complaints Commission with th five members, three of the five appointed by the United Nations, and they were foreigners. This was set up under Afghan law, so the Afghans asked the UN to do this. And that body had the power to review the actions of the Independent Election Commission, which it did, and it threw out enough fraudulent ballots to cause a second round. Now Karzai has taken over that body. Uh, he has issued a decree uh, allowing him to appoint all five members, uh, and in a very skillful and, and one might say devious maneuver, uh, he has said, uh, I, have, I can do this by decree. The parliament, which is in recess, normally would be able to change his decree, which it would because it's controlled by the opposition, but he says the Constitution prevents the parliament from changing the election law within a year of the election. You're stuck. A brilliant coup. How, how, how can it be... Uh somehow countermanded or overcome? I mean, it can't, if you're, what you're saying is true, that the decision was taken within that one year, or can it be changed at the end of that one year? Yeah, after well, uh, presumably, Karzai, who issued the decree, could rescind the decree. But, but this is not an issue uh, that's going to be settled in Afghanistan. The question is, will the United States, will Great Britain, will the countries that have the troops on the ground go to Mr. Karzai and say, sorry, but it's not acceptable for us to be having 140,000 of our men and women on the ground propping up your government and for you to be engaging in a process that's blatantly aimed at stealing elections. And, and it's not just the question of democracy in Afghanistan, it's a question of stability in Afghanistan. These fraudulent presidential elections last August uh, uh, were the greatest propaganda coup for the Taliban. Uh, they undermined support in the United States and Britain and Europe for the military mission. They, they halted the momentum of, of President Obama's uh, new policy. And why should we have 140,000 troops uh, fighting in Afghanistan when the Afghan president works against what we're trying to achieve? Why indeed? And the question is, therefore, will any of the countries you've just mentioned step in in some forceful way? They could, couldn't they? I mean, he's obviously dependent on the United States for money as well as all the soldiers, etc., etc. These well, countries, these other countries, could step in if they had the will. Of, of course they could, and, and that is an issue now for uh, Washington and London and uh, Paris and Berlin. Uh, <coughs> beyond that, Afghanistan cannot conduct elections. 
unless they're paid for by the international community. The elections last August were paid for by $300 million from Western taxpayers. Now, why the taxpayers should have paid for a fraudulent election, and, and there was a real problem that the UN, the head of the mission, didn't supervise uh, those, how the money was being spent. In fact, said it was none of, the, none of the UN's business, which was itself stunning. But now, uh, it could be up to the US Congress and other legislatures to basically say, we will not appropriate a penny for these phony elections uh, unless the Electoral Complaints Commission is reinstated as it was and, in, and unless there's a truly independent uh, election commission. In other words, change the composition of the body that's actually running the election. Otherwise, frankly, there's no point in holding elections. And how in the meantime is the Operation Operation Mostrat going? Well, Operation Mostrat is going uh, fine. It's, it's uh, achieving success. But that was always going to be the case. It was always going to be the case that uh, the NATO troops were going to be able to take territory against the Taliban, which is a, dis, you know, a, a poor, loosely organized uh, guerrilla movement, follows the precepts of Mao. I'm sure they haven't read Mao. But when, when uh, the Western troops come in, the Taliban um, uh, fade away. But in order for counterinsurgency to work, uh, you then, unless your troops are going to be there forever, you need an Afghan army that can come in and provide sec uh, security, an Afghan police that can provide law and order, and most importantly, an Afghan government that can provide honest administration, essential public services, and win the confidence of the population. And that element, uh, an Afghan, a credible Afghan partner, does not exist. Uh, after all, the Karzai government's been in office for eight years. It's been characterized by ineffectiveness, corruption, now it's in office by fraud. There's no possibility that that administration is going to be a credible partner. And so in the long term, it's very hard to see how this counterinsurgency strategy will succeed. But we can't remove Karzai even if we wish to, can we? No. In uh, practical and, terms. And, and, and I, I, I think everybody understands that uh, you, you cannot change uh, governments. Uh, this was tried disastrously as... Uh, uh, you and I will recall in Vietnam in 1963. Uh, so uh, you're, you're stuck with him. And so the, 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 it, you get to the second question, which is if you cannot accomplish your mission because there isn't a credible partner, then uh, you don't need to answer the question of whether the war is important or right or wrong. It's not worth the resources because the strategy you're following isn't going to work. Now, I'm not in favor of withdrawal from Afghanistan. I think there are important things that still can be done, but I think the objectives ought to be limited to those that are achievable. And I would say that includes securing Kabul and securing the 55% of the country that is not Pashtun, because the Taliban's purely a Pashtun movement from the largest ethnic group, no support among uh, the Tajiks, Hazars, Uzbeks, the other major ethnic groups. So the Taliban can't win. The trouble is that uh, we can't win. Uh, and so let us keep the Taliban out of Kabul, out of the non-Pashtun parts of the country, and uh, over time maybe the situation will evolve, but we don't need 140,000 troops to do that. Thank you very much. It's, the amazing thing is I've interviewed President Karzai several times, once when just when he'd been, been appointed, and to meet the man, what we've just been talking about, is absolutely astonishing. I mean, he's charming, clear, you know, all of those things. and. Uh, and has survived in a terrible, and yet the other side of the tale is this extraordinary tale well, of fraud. Well, he, well, he is, he is charming, uh, and uh, I think some of this uh, action against the electoral complaint, he's, he's very emo emotional, he's very emotional, mm -hmm. and some of this action against the Electoral Complaints Commission is also because he's angry at what they did. Uh, but there's another element of this. Look, uh, this fraud wasn't necessary. In fact, early in my tenure in Afghanistan, I'd talk to Afghanistan uh, officials, and I'd say, Karzai should not pull a Nixon. By what I, what I meant, why steal an election you've already won? Yeah. Uh, it had, obviously, disastrous consequences for Nixon, forcing him out of office, and, and Karzai uh, is now, he may not be forced out of office, but his credibility around the world is shot. His credibility in his own country is shot among large segments of the population. That's a core part of the problem. He's seen as illegitimate. Uh, and the crisis has simply gotten worse. Peter, thank you very much indeed for being with us. Well, David, good uh, to be with you. That's also rousing and clear. Thank you. Well, thank you. Peter Galbraith, Jesse Jackson.
is on his way to the studio right now and he'll be here after this short break.